Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Classics Revisited webinar series. We are so happy to be continuing this great conversation to prov and providing a work break with more titles of our world. Today, we are beginning a the next section of our Revisited series, or what the professor and I consider the next session, um, and that's short discussions on long books. Over the next six months, we're gonna be talking about um, and tackling some longer, heavier titles than we've done in the past, beginning with Manuel Kant's Foundations of the Metaphysics of Morals. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to log in and get settled. While we do that, please set the chat panel to make sure you're sharing with all attendees and panelists and let us know where you're joining from today. We'd love to hear from you. Um, a 1784 work of political and moral philosophy, Kant's foundations of the metaphysics of morals bring a light, uh, bring to light a discussion of rights versus virtual virtues, and the idea of that rational thought leads to moral actions. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion, and would love to hear all the questions that Dr. Segru's lecture may inspire. Today, I have the great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Michael Segru to our ongoing webinar series, Classics Revisited. Dr. Segru, a professor, is a graduate of the Great Books program. He earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Master's of Philosophy and PhD in history from Columbia University. Professor Segru has taught at prestigious universities such as Princeton, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and many more. My name is Christy Goebel. I'm a global marketing specialist here at Biblioteca and behind the scenes we have my colleague Mackenzie Crane helping to make sure everything runs smoothly. We're so excited to continue these conversations with the professor. We will be sharing the chat log with all the attendees so make sure you switch your settings to all attendees and panelists so that everybody can see what you're sharing with um, and if you have any questions or comments based on the uh, lecture. If you do have specific questions that you wanna be brought up in uh, the Q&A after, please use the Q&A panel. Uh, the like button helps float the most popular questions to the top. So please use that feature if you see similar questions to something you want answered. Once again, we are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion and would love to hear all of the questions that Dr. Segru's lecture may inspire. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to the professor. We have pre-recorded uh, his lecture today uh, about a month or so ago, but he will be joining us after the lecture for that live Q&A. Please enjoy. Manual Kant's very short very long book is uh, a great achievement in the history of moral thinking. Uh, it was written in 1784 and it is an extremely powerful contribution to the uh, literature of ethics. Uh, Kant in some ways offers us a kind of universal algorithm uh, a kind of meta law, a meta rule that governs all the, the other moral choices that people make. So in other words, it's a kind of super rule and uh, it's the standard uh, by which all moral judgment can be made. So what Kant offers us in some ways is what Plato threatened us with, a kind of mathematized, logicized account of right and wrong that creates clear, distinct lines between right and wrong. I mean, it gives you real yeses and nos, and it is extremely deep and penetrating. So uh, uh, Kant's Foundations of the Metaphysics of Morals is a singular event. Here's why. I mean, there are lots of reasons why, but... Um, Aristotle, when he wrote the Nicomachean Ethics, um, assumed that ethics was a kind of rough and ready practical knowledge, like say carpentry or barbering. It's something, it's, it's an act that people 
have, it doesn't really achieve platonic mathematical reality. But he said, look, it's good and it's practical and useful. Kant says, no, ethics is not a rough and ready practical not, uh, knowledge with simple rules of thumb that allow for, di for difference. Instead, he provides us with the universal yardstick by which we judge good and evil. And Kant called this the categorical imperative, um, or CI for short. Now, the categorical imperative is a rule by which you can judge the good, goodness and evil of every action, yours and those of every other rational agent, because all rational agents have a moral obligation to obey this rule based upon the uh, demands of reason itself. So what Kant says is uh, that an action is good if and only if it is done for the right reason. He is going to insist that intentions are important in judging moral, in judging moral action. And that I think is uh, uncontroversially true. Uh, that's why we have, for example, categories of crime like uh, attempted murder or conspiracy to commit fraud. You, we don't prosecute just fraud and murder, but rather the attempt to do so or the intent whether they actually succeed in doing that or not. So yeah, um, in practice, intentions matter. Okay, um, what Kant says is that the only good thing is a good intention. Uh, you do your best to get a good outcome, but it actually, uh, the morality of an action is not based upon its outcome. It's based upon, it's following the rules of reason itself. So. Remember that for German philosophers like Kant and like Hegel, to be rational is the same thing as being free. And for Kant, you are free only when you act on the basis of reason as opposed to your passions or desires. And he has his own special lingo for this. Um, his terms are heteronomy and autonomy. Heteronomy means doing things because you have a particular desire and it leads to what he calls hypothetical imperatives. Let me give you an example of a hypothetical imperative and heteronomy. You want uh, a hamburger, so you go to a restaurant. That is um, one way of looking at freedom and reason. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can act in ways that are not heteronomous. You can also choose to act autonomously. And what you do then is use the demands of reason itself, the categorical imperative, to rein yourself in from following a malicious intent, which everybody sooner or later has. So think of it this way. The categorical imperative states <clears throat> that you should act in such a way that you could wish that the maximum of your action, which means the principle that your action instantiates, that, the, that you could wish that that would become a universal law of nature. In other words, that everybody should do that all the time. Uh, that, Kant says, is the ultimate problem in all of morality. Murderers never want to get murdered. Pickpockets don't want their wallet stolen. But although they recognize that they want other people to follow that moral rule, don't steal, don't kill, um, what they do is say, well, everybody should follow that, move, that rule except me. I'm gonna make an exception for myself. So the problem with morality is not that we don't understand what we're supposed to do. We understand that pretty well because it's very straightforward. What we don't have is the desire to obey the moral law that we all recognize for everybody but us. And what Kant is telling us that if is that if people did not carve out exceptions to universally acknowledge moral rules and apply them just to themselves, 
that would be the end of all the evil in the world. So the problem of evil is not that we don't know what we're supposed to do, it's that we don't want to do it. That's because we fall prey to heteronomy, to the, the desires that are external to reason itself. So if you want a book, go to the library. If you want a hamburger, go to the cafeteria. If you want uh, 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 to play basketball, go to the gymnasium. Um, those are all hypothetical imperatives. If you want X, then go do Y. The categorical imperative isn't structured like that. It doesn't say if X, then Y. It says do Z. <laughs> and that's that. It has nothing, no interest in the consequences of actions. What this rule does is make us very attentive to the demands of what's right, right? Uh, you, you'll find that moral theories uh, often move in uh, similar occupational circles. There's something about economics which tends to produce uh, uh, which, which tends to be connected with, with economics. So economics and utilitarianism, highly connected. You know, the idea of graphing and optimizing pleasures. Uh, uh, most mathematicians are closet Platonists, whether they admit it or not. Uh, they believe that there's a realm of forms and mathematics one way or another leads us to it. Um, in the case of Kantians, you'll find that most judges are Kantians because they're interested in the rule that's being observed, because they're, they're interested in what's right. And that means restraining our impulses that are inconsistent with what's right. So what it means is you're not truly free until you impose self-restraint. It's a very interesting way of thinking about freedom. Uh, Kant thinks that freedom is autonomy. That's when you make rules for yourself and obey them conscientiously. Uh, someone like John Stuart Mill sees freedom as liberty, which means simply the physical ability to do things, as in uh, the dog is free of the chain or the prisoner is free of his cell. Uh, that's not what Kant means. What Kant means about these matters is autonomy, which is from Greek autonomos, making laws for yourself and then enforcing them conscientiously, all right? Uh, if you wanted an analogy to understand that, um, look at what it would be on the social level, on the macro level. Um, is a, a, a people free when it's in a state of anarchy, when everybody does whatever they want, pop, whatever pops into their head because there's no rule of law and there's no enforcement of law? Well, anarchy is uh, not appealing to most people. And that's what the large scale of liberty would be. On the other hand, when we see a, a nation that makes laws for itself, legislates for itself, and then obeys those laws conscientiously, um, that's one way of looking at freedom. And that's a complicated idea of freedom, but the idea of freedom was, as autonomy has many attractions. So what Kant is offering us is a particular, a particularly rigid and particularly precise conception of freedom. It's working against your inclinations, wielding the categorical imperative like a nightstick to smack your disorderly feelings into uh, line. Let me give you an example, show you what I mean. Um, Kant says, all right, that if you find a wallet, you look at it and then you see the person who, to whom it belongs. And then you ask yourself, what could I universally wish that people should do when they find wallets? And the answer is return it to its owner, not taking anything away. Okay, that's true because that's the maximum we can universalize. Now, suppose we're tempted to steal the money and the credit cards. Suppose this belongs to the person we like least, that we think is a monster and a horrible human being. Kant says, under those circumstances, it's even more important to return it to them because you wicked creature, you're seriously, malevolently 
considering doing the wrong thing. And you're really, and you're do, willing to do this because you're being heteronymous. You're being pushed around by your feelings and by your libido and your, by your desire to harm this person. And you're being pushed away from doing what you know perfectly well is right. So you know perfectly well what to do. You take this wallet to the person you like least and you give it back. And the, the, the less you like the person, the better a thing it is for you to do when you go and overcome that terrible impulse. On the other hand, you find your friend's wallet and you give it back to him. The moral status of that depends on whether you do it. If you're a, a real reprobate and you consider stealing your friend's money, but then you slap yourself back into line using the categorical imperative, that's a good thing to do. On the other hand, uh, if, on the other hand, you, get, uh, you gave it back to your friend without any impulse to steal, but rather because he's your friend and the intention you had was to gratify your friend and help him out, then, although it's not a wrong thing to do, it doesn't have any moral status because the reason why you're doing it is your feelings of generosity and goodwill towards your friend. Kant says, look, moral action as moral action can't be driven by heteronomy, can't be driven by feelings or emotions or anything but reason, regardless of whether those feelings are benevolent or malevolent. Because he says morals is not about feelings either way. It's about overcoming your feelings and doing the right thing every time and doing it for the right reason. So what Kant is going to do is say something like this. Um, those of you that want to follow expediency, and that's one way of thinking about utilitarianism, which hasn't been sketched out yet. Remember that Kant is writing this in 1784. Um, the great diamond cutter Kant um, says, look, there are certain lines between right and wrong that we dare not transgress under any circumstances. Right is right and wrong is wrong. So, for example, anytime we cannot universalize the maxim of our action, we're being pushed around by heteronomy by our libido. And Kant says, the way to be free is to govern yourself. And that's actually a powerful insight. Remember Socrates' idea in the Republic that no one is fit to govern other people until they learn to govern themselves? Well, Kant gives you a rule for self-governance. It's a kind of stoic rule. It's very rigid, but it gives very clear answers. There are things you do not do and there are lines you do not cross. This is why judges as a kind of occupational hazard are very often Kantians because they have to be interested in doing things in the right way. So uh, if a judge is at an arraignment in the morning and a defendant comes in with a signed confession but the defendant is in a, a sling and has got two black eyes and a broken nose and he's, he looks like he's been beaten up pretty badly. If the judge asks the police, uh, by the way, did you tune this guy up before getting the confession out of him? Because he looks like he's been given a pretty good beating. If the police say yes, but it turns out he really is the killer or really is the criminal, what the judge is, will have to say is that, yeah, you did something good, but what you did wasn't right because they're not always exactly the same thing. And Kant shows, look, rules are rules. And we have rules against beating up suspects because I, as a judge, can't be sure whether this guy is really guilty or whether you beat him so hard and he's looking pretty bad that he was willing to sign anything. And we know such cases happen. Don't bring me confessions that have been beaten out of suspects. And that means that the suspect goes free. Now, here we have the Kantian issue. What Kant is saying is there are certain lines we don't cross and that the line between right and wrong is very clear. And I can't allow this as a judge. 
all right? Um, think about it another way. Think about one of the, uh, say, um, one of the nightmare cases of utilitarianism, right? Imagine that people uh, in the Middle Ages somewhere, people believe in witches. Uh, they, someone, someone's cow died, people decided that it was caused by a hex, uh, and that the hex came from the old lady with 20 cats. Uh, they bring her to the king, and they say, we want to burn her because she's a witch. As the king, you know perfectly well that there aren't any witches, and the old lady isn't a witch, and that that's not what caused the cow to die. Um, the Kantian says straightforwardly, look, this lady is innocent, and I don't convict innocent people. I also don't punish innocent people because I can't universalize the maximum of such wicked deeds. So here's the score. The lady is not going to get burned, regardless of whether you like it or not, because I know the difference between right and wrong. Well, I mean, it's hard not to sympathize with that. The utilitarian comes back and says, look, what if the people then riot and that it results in, say, 10 deaths or 20 deaths or 100 deaths? Would you still be willing to spare the old lady? And the Kantian says, absolutely. I don't play games. I don't cut deals. We don't punish the innocent, no matter how hysterical, unreasonable people get. Right and wrong are real things. So look, there's something to be said for that because it is a big problem that some people should be burned gratuitously. On the other hand, a complete indifference to consequences, which is part of the Kantian philosophy or deep uh, interest only in the intentions of the agent, um, often runs astray or against people's intuitions about right and wrong, right? If you get um, a tremendous advantage for a great number of people, whether we would be justified in doing some great wrong or even some trivial wrong, Kantian says, no dice. The utilitarian says, talk to me about numbers. <laughs> the utilitarian does a cost-benefit analysis. The problem is that this cost-benefit analysis can very quickly and very easily become undeniably evil. Suppose 90% of a culture wants to murder 10%. Or for that matter, suppose that it wants to that 51% wants to kill 49%. If they really like it a lot, you know, if you have some enough British happiness units, maybe you could justify that. But Kant is going to leave out things like torture and violence. Reason doesn't allow for that kind of behavior. All right. Why? Because you can't universalize the maxim. Now, um, it may seem like Kant is doing something very complicated and very um, airy, but it's not. Actually, this idea of the categorical imperative is so complicated. We teach it to five-year-olds every year, to uh, children, Johnny and Janie, go to school. At some point in the first year of school, it occurs to Johnny that he might want to pull Janie's hair. Why? Because it's there, and this is what people do. Um, you know, it's a strange quality that human beings have. If they're not, if they're not supervised, they end up getting in trouble. And uh, then the teacher says to Johnny, Johnny, you mustn't pull Janie's hair. And Johnny asks why, and the teacher says, how would you like it if people pulled your hair? And then he says, no, I wouldn't like that at all. And so then the teacher says, well, Johnny, if you don't want your hair pulled, you mustn't pull anybody else's hair. Now, what this sounds like is the golden rule. And it's true, it is. But the categorical imperative is something like a, a logically supercharged version of the golden rule. Here's why. The golden rule is going to let you down in a small number of cases. Here's why. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you means that you want others to do to you whatever contingent inclinations you might have to do for others. Let me give you an example. Suppose a, an undergraduate 
gets money from his parents first of every month and he buys uh, a bottle of whiskey and a bag of grass and they have a big weekend him and his friends he may actually be doing unto others what he would have them do unto him um he may wish that his roommate who gets money on the 15th of the month should also buy a bottle of whiskey and a bag of grass we may all on the other hand, decide that that particular application of the golden rule is not what we had hoped for. It's a, it's a bad deployment. Now, here's how the categorical imperative is different. All right. Um, the categorical imperative says, act such that you could wish the maximum of your action could become a universal law of nature. Wish means there in this case, not whatever it is you might wish, like chocolate as opposed to vanilla ice cream. Rather, wish means rationally intend. What could you rationally intend would be universalized? And I don't think we would rationally intend the universalizing of whiskey and marijuana for undergraduates. So the categorical imperative is a logically more rigorous version of the categorical imperative or rather the golden rule. And it's a restatement of absolute demands in politics and in ethics. All right, um, let me start my video here. <clears throat> and there's the professor, Mr. Michael, how are you doing today? Well, thank you, and yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So thank you so much. Um, you and I had a wonderful 10 minute chat before this about uh, a Kant and I might re ask some of the questions because some of your answers were really enlightening. But as uh, as we get started here, I would encourage all of our attendees to make sure that they're putting their questions into the question and answer box because that's what's at the front of my screen. So I'll be able to see it. But I have to say that um, the very first question I have for you goes back to how you ended the lecture was uh, with the golden rule. And part of it is just, um, it, it's kind of a funny, funny situation. I think you and I chatted about when we first recorded this, but, but cate categorical imperative versus the golden rule. Um, so my son Quinn is seven, about a year, year and a half ago, I want to say, I guess it was before COVID because he was at school. So he was in kindergarten. Um, then I'm guessing most parents have gone through something like this. Like I had taught him the golden rule. We had talked about it. His teachers obviously taught it too in various forms. And he comes back home one day and he told, tells me that he hit a friend. And I was just like, but why did you hit a friend? Well, because he hit me. And I was just like, okay, well, even if he hits you, you shouldn't hit him back. And he's like, well, but that's what you taught me to do. And I was just like, what do you mean I taught you to, to hit him back? And he, he said something along the lines of like, well, he hit me, so therefore he wanted to get hit, so I hit him back. <laughs> um, with that, um, with Kant, is it Quinn's actions, Quinn's my son, is it Quinn's actions since his intent was to honor the rule he was taught, or is Quinn in the wrong because his actions were not moral or just, and just the reaction, um, and, and so therefore is the reaction is what is judged versus the act of the other boy. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, look, I'm a father too, so I, I know. <laughs> God sends people children in order that they may learn the virtue of patience. Yes. <laughs> right. uh, I, I take that as undeniable. I have three daughters and I have learned it and learned it well. Now, with regard to your son, Quinn. Well, the problem is we've left out a third part of our moral judgment. And that goes back to Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to include it in this series, but it's a wonderful book. I made a, a passing reference to it when I compared Aristotle's view of ethics to Kant's. Aristotle's is like cooking, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little <laughs> bit of the other things. Kant's is like chemistry. No, 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 I want exactly 1.4 grams of that, all right? And no more, no less. So um, I would say that uh, Aristotle still has something to be said for him, two reasons. First, because he says that um, ethics requires what he calls phrenesis, which is good judgment. And he says that comes with experience and time. Not everybody that's old has phrenesis, but nobody that's young has it, <laughs> right? And there's some truth in that. I think about 16-year-old boys with cars. 
Okay. Now, what Aristotle says is that, well, what really is important here is context and judgment. Was Quinn threatened? How hard was he hit? Was it, was it, was it just horsing around? Or did he actually assume a boxing stance or a, you know, a mm -hmm. judo stance and, and want to engage in a fight? Um, a lot of things about the background circumstances are important. Is he your friend? So was he just playing around? Or did he want your lunch money? So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. And Aristotle says, um, because it's a rule of thumb, practical endeavor ethics, we would need to know all that. I think that there's a part of Aristotle that's right. Okay. Interesting. Um, I see a couple of questions coming in from the chat. Uh, make sure you go ahead and put those in the question and answer box, but since they're right at the top, I'll go ahead and grab them. Uh, so one of our uh, audience members is asking, what's a good place to start with Kant if you're completely new to him? Okay, mm, this is tough. Um, Kant is a commitment, it's not easy, okay? Mm -hmm. um, one of my students once described it as like, wading through wet cement while it dries around you, all right? <laughs> um, particularly for Anglophones, people whose first language is English, the Anglo-American Scottish tradition is much more accessible than the German, all right? Um, so where would I start with Kant? I start small. Some of his essays are quite good. One of them called What is Enlightenment is a fine choice. Another one is called Perpetual Peace. One of the funny things you'll see in that is that if you read it closely and then you go to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points at the end of the First World War, you will find that all of the 14 points are derived from that Kantian essay. And Wilson's connection to Kant is not very well recognized in the literature. But all I ask you to do is compare them and you'll be able to derive 14 out of 14 from that 12 or 15 page essay. So the idea of a universe, well, for example, uh, the, the man who thought up the idea of the League of Nations is named Immanuel Kant. And he introduces the idea in perpetual peace. It's not an accident that Woodrow Wilson tried to um, realize that, but also he was completely unwilling to make any kind of deal with Henry Cabot Lodge and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee because Kantians don't do that. It's not an accident that Wilson, before becoming president, was the professor of law and political philosophy at Princeton. So the connection between Kant and Woodrow Wilson, in other words, the real life implications of ideas, uh, is well worth looking at. Take a look at those two essays, and I think that's a good place for you to start, ma'am. Wonderful. Yeah, I was. Um, you had warned me about this one. It's, it's not... Uh, it's funny that we're starting with this one with um, when you and I had chatted about the next six uh, novels that we're doing, that this is probably the shortest of all of them. Yeah. It's not necessarily a long book, but um, you warned me that it was going to be the longest 70 pages I've ever read. And, and let me tell you, I you know made it through a lot of it. I listened to the whole thing um, on a recording yesterday, too, just for while I was researching it. I think Kenzie has that that she can share with the audience if you want to listen to it versus read it. Um, but yeah, it's 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 dry, but it's so fascinating and interesting to hear the differences once you start really kind of interpreting and, and taking it bit by bit. Let's hear one of the questions that just came in is how do you think Kantian approach relates to the creation of moral norms themselves? When something like love, love stranger like himself was said, it went above and beyond norms of morality. Sometimes people do something heroic, which cannot be done by ordinary people and cannot be a rule of actions for everyone. That's right. Um, there are great achievements in thought or in art or in politics that aren't accessible to everyone, but you can still create maxims about the conduct for anyone who enters into the, the situation that you are. <laughs> so no, you cannot get away. You just create a hypothetical you, and then you keep on multiplying them like the, uh, well, the guy in the matrix is an infinite number of them. Mm -hmm. So you, you cannot get away from universalizing the maxim, even if you're the only p person, Picasso, that can paint Guernica. Okay, okay. 
He, our, our one Picasso may ask himself, should I side with the Nazis or with the poor Spanish parents, uh, peasants who got bombed by the Nazis? Well, yeah. he's decided that he's going to universalize the maxim, which is why ethics connects directly to politics for context. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, well, and especially with the, the right versus wrong and just the moral decisions and judgment there. Yeah. Um, going further with some of the audience questions, is the CI grounded in the idea that all people are created equal, hence the importance of doing only what you'd wish everyone to do, or possibly vice versa? Okay. Um, Kant is an egalitarian in a radical sense. He has a great admiration, it may surprise you, for Rousseau, all right, um, mm -hmm. because of Rousseau's idea of the general will. The, you could say that what the categorical imperative do, does is express the general will. What would we want if everybody were called upon to will the right set of human actions? So uh, um, Kant is, is a deep egalitarian. He's also a social contractarian, right? Like Rousseau. Now, um, Everyone has moral significance, and no one's moral significance can be part of some kind of bargain to get some great good or some small good. In other words, nobody is fungible. Okay. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, those of you who know Rawlsian political philosophy, uh, the theory of justice by John Rawls, um, it's not an accident that Rawls initially intended to become a minister when he was at Princeton. He later becomes the greatest political philosopher of his time. But um, the whole point of a theory of justice is deeply Kantian, and it's also deeply Christian. Kant and Rawls would agree that almost all of ethics, perhaps all of ethics, hangs on one line of scripture. Whatsoever you do to the least of my brethren, that you do unto me. Okay. So the poor guy that had the confession beaten out of him, all right. Um, even if it, even if he's guilty, we don't do that because he's Jesus. He's valuable. He's sacred because all of us are. So I have to um, go into the religious side of things because a lot of the books that we've talked about in the past, you know, eighteen months or so, eighteen months, past year, um, have been, you know, like, and it's true for a lot of books written at that time. Religion is such a, you know heavy influence on, on historical literature, on, on theory, on philosophy, on political, you know, like it has a lot of stuff going on. Um, I started to question, I think you and I chatted about this a little bit um, prior to the, the webinar today, I started to question how Kant's philosophy had possibly disrupted the religious views of the time. Uh, yep. One of the questions I came up with against my research was, uh, you know, asked why Jesus Christ couldn't serve as a model for moral action with the article going on to say that Kant sought to remove ethics from the realm of religion and place them instead on a wholly rational foundation. Um, further research, I found that the early 19th century religious revival across Europe and early America may have been a direct correlation to the surviving atheism and materialism, as well as uh, Kantism essentially of the 18th century philosophers. Um, and that religious fervor, and as well as the intensity of the Gothic movement, filled the void created by the previous simple, and this is a quote, mechanical formulas laid out by the philosophers such as Kant. Could you expound a little bit on Kant versus religion, how they might go together versus how Kant was separating himself from that? All right. What Kant does is, and he's not the first to do this, I mean, think of Hume, but he, he severs revelation from ethics. It is possible for someone to deduce the categorical imperative uh, without encountering a burning bush. This makes him a persona non grata for many of the Christian sects of his time, but he was deeply religious. His family was pietists, which is to say Anabaptists, very rigorous believers, and he himself wrote a whole book called "Religion Within the Re uh, Within the Re Bounds of Reason Alone." And believe me, when he lays down the hard law about something like that, he has come to lay down the clear, bright lines. I mean, that's all he does. 
So whereas things are a little bit of a, uh, of a you know, little dab of this, touch of that with Aristotle because it's fuzzy, Kant says, I will not live with fuzziness. Everything has a set of rules. I can deduce them, I can figure them out, and I can explain how they are absolutely necessary um, to our understanding of ourselves. So that's, for example, how he gets over against when dealing with Hume, he comes up with the a priori forms, the, the, the preconditions of human experience, because he's convinced Hume is wrong. Uh, his contributions to philosophy do not in any way undercut uh, the fact that he and Kegel both call themselves Orthodox Lutherans. But I'm pretty sure they're Orthodox Lutherans in a way that nobody, even Luther himself, understood. Okay, okay. So it's it's a it's a combination of uh, taking the you know philosophy of man and putting it into his eyes in the sense of how he is interpreting his religion and and continuing from there, even though obviously the church didn't necessarily agree with his interpretation of that rule. Not the church and not mainline Protestant sects because of this, you know, a lot of this uh, unmooring of the categorical imperative from Revelation doesn't mean it's in conflict with Revelation, but it does raise the question of what you need Revelation for once you have this, right? Plug and chug, you get the right answer. Yeah. Kant described himself as the Newton of the moral world. Okay. He was trying to be to the domain of freedom what Newton was to the domain of causal necessity. Okay. Newton gives you three laws, Kant gives you one. <laughs> this is what, and so no, that is, uh, that's exactly the point he's making. That's what he thinks he is. He thinks yeah. he's new ethics for this new science. Okay. Changing gears a little bit back to an audience question here is how could Kant admire Rousseau who sent all his children to an orphanage? Rousseau might, uh, might have had a great idea, but he behaved like a moral human being, like an immoral. You are immoral. absolutely right. Personally, I find Rousseau repulsive, all right? But my, I come from the old school where teaching isn't primarily about you learning about my feelings. Instead, I'd like to talk to you about the history of Western thought. And whether I like him or not, um, Rousseau is an important figure in Western thought. I have actually made the supreme sacrifice. I have read the entirety of Rousseau's confessions, and that's three days I'm never going to get back. <laughs> so, uh, um, yes, how could Kant admire him? Kant wasn't his confessor. Kant was just looking for new ideas to build a system up. All right. If we had to stick with kind philosophers, I mean, besides Socrates and Spinoza, I don't know how many of them there really are, but that's just me. The track of philosophers and influencing each other is always an interesting one to me to, to see line of thought and train of thought uh, between one philosopher and another and how each other interprets what the what their predecessors have said and either completely change it and or you know go off of it obviously Hegel did follow Kant's theory but you know one of the ones that you brought up numerous times that we've had a discussion about um, a, a number of weeks back was uh, John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. Um, you know, we covered that book a little bit ago in one of our previous lectures. Could you explain further the relationship or influence between the two men? Was Mills yeah. arguing against Kant's initial proposal or expounding on it? How do their outlines truly differ in the outlook of the greater good? Kant comes first, right? Kant is a product of the Enlightenment. The Germans join the rear guard of the Enlightenment. They, they join the Enlightenment late. It's dominated by English and French because the, Fr the Germans take about 100 years to rebuild after the wars of the Reformation. So the last but great contribution the Germans make to the Enlightenment is our friend Kant. Okay. Now, what's going to come after him is a romantic reaction. Goethe, for example, will participate in that. But there's going to be lots of, you know, uh, romantics in every culture of the West. I mean, think of William Blake, or think of Herman Melville, or think of um, Stendhal. Uh, you know, the great uh, romantic writers are going to give us some wonderful art, but they're going to sell reason short is the problem. 
In other words, we have a kind of pendulum movement from making too much out of reason to making too little out of reason. And it's very hard apparently for us to find a happy homeostasis between reason and love. Okay. Or the, the two great values and the two great poles of the human mind, I think. Right? Uh, reason is uh, necessary for the proper deployment of love, but unless it has love, reason doesn't know what it's supposed to do. Should I get a hamburger or should I kill my neighbor? I don't know. I mean, it depends on how you feel. Well, what are you going to add to your reason, assuming that it, reason is the slave of the passions? What are you going to add to it to keep you from doing stuff like that? And that's where uh, love comes in. Okay. So how deep do Kant's arguments go for moral acts to be judged on intention over consequence? Kind of going with the, the love and reason factor is that one of the lines you said in your lecture was um, intention over consequence, right? It, it's, yep. it's, the, right. it's the moral... Your, your moral choice is based on your intention, not on the consequence of your choice. Right. So you touched a bit on this, um, but could you go further? For example, would Kant side on a king, uh, on the side of a king who felt it was his moral and rational duty to invade a neighboring kingdom to provide more land to his, his subjects and himself, even if it meant the deaths of 50% of his subjects as a consequence? Well, um, the question of how to formulate the maxim that you're universalizing uh, can sometimes be quite difficult. What we want is maximum uh, extent, all right, and uh, minimum treatment of, uh, actually not just minimum, zero treatment of anyone else purely as a member of the kingdom of means. In other words, everybody is an end in themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there may be times, I don't know, maybe a famine time when uh, you have to actually look at that and the utilitarian is going gonna, is gonna to crunch the numbers. And he say, look, we got 60,000 dying unless we invade and that's 50,000 dying. What do you want me to do? Kant says, well, I want you to decide whether this is something you want to universalize or not. It's possible that under certain circumstances, you might. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So. Um, how we formulate that is often quite controversial. The more complicated the, the question, like uh, something like war and peace and all the amazing, extraordinary uh, things that go into that, make it hard to be sure that you're formulating the maxim properly. That's why we start with uh, easy, evident things like it's, it's wrong to lie. Why? Could you wish that everybody should lie to you all the time and that you should lie to everybody else and that we should reduce communication to nothing? No, no one rationally intend that. Now, war and peace is a lot more complicated than there. There's a, a, what I would call a lot more indeterminacy. Okay. But so, we're going to do it. So do Kant's theories then bring life to a moral individualistic way of thinking versus Mill's greater good? So you and I chatted about this a little bit. In other words, as long as your intentions were good and rational on the individual level, it does not matter what the outcome is. So life is on an individual basis, not a societal one. Okay, here's the, the thing. This will, this will be trippy for people who are raised as Anglophones. The Anglophone tradition of philosophy is very committed to individualism at many levels. You see it in Locke, for example. But German philosophy, um, with its different conception of reason, its more extensive teleological conception of reason, um, what that means is that uh, the set of rational agents is not just individual human beings, you know, encapsulated in specific human bodies. Instead, thing, uh, the categorical imperative, since it applies to all rational agents, it first of all applies to nations. Nations are understood to be collective subjects, right? In the same way that an individual person, you, Christy, or me, Michael, are individual subjects. Well, we're part of a larger collective subject called the United States. And it has a will, it has moral responsibilities, and it is rational, it's a rational agent. That's why Woodrow Wilson thought that it was absolutely imperative 
not something he could negotiate, to join the League of Nations, which is Kant's idea. The League of Nations is between nations what the social contract is between individuals. And since it's rational to do one, it's rational to do the other. So here's the deal. Rather than being purely individualistic, when you plug in this idea of collective subjects mm -hmm. uh, and rational agents, uh, what you're going to find is that the categorical imperative is, is required for all human beings individually. It's also required for all nations and maybe required for a, collect for a collective subsets within nations. We'll see about that. Uh, the angels, because Kant believes in them, they uh, follow the categorical imperative 100% of the time, except for that one time when they ended up in hell. And uh, God, God is perfectly free and perfectly rational. And that means that Kant's idea of God uh, obeys the categorical imperative 100% of the time. Interesting. It's an interesting look as like, you know, because that's something we learned even back in social studies in middle school is the, the you know, individual into a society, into a larger, you know, but eventually you do get the society, you know, like that, that rule of thumb that it's still an individual, it's just an individual nation versus an individual on a, on a human level. Interesting. So I have just a couple more questions here from the audience. And then um, unfortunately, we're going to be running out of some time. So is Kant all about judgment? Is the metaphysics of morals a judgment toolkit for how to make the right judgment? Okay. First off, you can't imagine at this point, if you haven't read it, how carefully and precisely Kant uses language. There is nothing poetic about it. So you just called this the metaphysics of morals. I beg to differ. There's an entire separate book by Kant called The Metaphysics of Morals. What we read for today is another book called The Foundations of the Metaphysics of Morals. And when Kant put foundations in the title, that means it's a completely different book, right? So I want you to stop and think about how precisely this guy is using language and why he needs, that's why he needs to deploy his own lingo, all right? So now, um, what we learned in the foundations of the metaphysics of morals is that there are obligations which are incumbent and intrinsic to being a rational agent. Kant's big contribution to philosophy is that he asked the question, what has to be true for human experience to be possible at all? And the wild set, the jack-in-the-box set of answers that comes out to that turns out to be uh, a world historical achievement that I don't have the time to explain to you right now. Okay. Um, another question that came is, what do you make of the role of intuition in all of this, a la Bergson, or Bergson, excuse me? Okay, Kant is the opposite of Bergson, in the sense, okay. remember the beginning of Bergson's introduction to metaphysics, first line, and that, this is a rocking line, I got to admit it. Metaphysics is the science that claims to dispense with symbols. Good Lord, I don't know where to begin with an idea like that. I really liked it when I was 22 because I had no idea what it means. Uh, now I like it less because I'm 64 and I have no idea what it means. So um, Bergson is always interested in becoming, in transformation, whereas Kant wants to turn everything into logical crystals. Okay. Uh, one is drawn from Parmenides, the other from Heraclitus. Okay, interesting. And uh, final question of the day. Thank you so much again for, for joining us, Michael. It's been great. Um, Kant himself talks about the genius creating original ideas, not knowing where these ideas come from. How do you think the genius can remain within the boundaries of Kantian freedom if he does not know the source of his maxim while he creates? Well, um, you fill it in ex post facto. In other words, you find out about yourself in the process of applying these rational rules. In other words, the, uh, how can I put it? The, the list of your application of, of uh, these rational universal rules, some of them you get right and some of them you fall and you do the wrong thing. But that list is, is identical when you uh, sum, sum it with like the big sigma to your character. So you are a collection of moral choices. And the better you are, the more your moral choices approximate that 100% categorical imperative that God hits. The worse you get is the one that never does that. 
And that, of course, is the evil one. Love it. I could talk about this all day. Unfortunately, we don't have all day. So thank you so much, Michael, for the great conversation. It's a pleasure as always. It's thank you all. interesting and thought provoking as always to say the least. And I'm looking forward to uh, next month for our next one. I always look forward there's to a, it. There's a lecture that I have posted, you know, on Kant, if that helps at all. You know, good yep, we've have. already shared it with the group too. So if they wanted oh, okay. to get a little bit more in depth with you, um, we definitely do have that lecture um, within the chat and that chat will be shared with everybody. God bless well. and good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. So if you are enjoying these Classics Revisited series with the professor, our next webinar will be on August 17th with Rawls, A Theory of Justice. We brought that up a couple of times during the Q&A. Um, we have also set a lecture per month for the remainder of the year, including titles like Moby Dick, Ulysses, the brothers Carmen, <laughs> I'm going to say it wrong, Kara Mazav, and the Magic Mountain. So be, I'll learn that name before we get to that lecture. So be sure to keep an eye on our website. The one for August 17th should be popping up on our website next week and an email will be going out um, for the invite as, as well, excuse me. If you enjoyed today's webinar, Biblioteca is continually adding to our virtual event lineup. We invite you to view all on demand and upcoming events online at biblioteca.com and then navigate to our insights and trends blog and make sure you are subscribed to receive all webinar updates by navigating to the bottom of any page on our website and hitting subscribe. Finally, as we finish today off, we would love for everyone to complete a quick survey. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, ideas, let us know. We love to hear from you and use your feedback to continually evolve the webinar series we offer to libraries around the world. Just a reminder, we will circulate the chat log and links to resources in our follow-up email. Also, we do make uh, the professor's lectures and Q&A public by putting them on YouTube. This way you can definitely share them with any patrons that you may want to um, and they do not have to fill out any forms or navigate to our website. They can go directly to YouTube, Biblioteca's playlist channel for the Classics Revisited series. But keep an eye on um, any future uh, follow-up emails regarding this particular webinar. And thank you so much again for joining us. Have a great day.